I'll introduce our panel of experts first. So um, in no particular order, looking at the names on the list and the seat, seating, we'll start from the, uh, my left, uh, which is Jim Cowney, uh, Principal Engineer at Intel. Uh, Roger Shepard, some of you may have known Roger or seen Roger in the multi-core for mobile. Uh, Roger is chipless limited. Um, David May, you've probably uh, seen already. So David May University at Bristol. And uh, a late change, uh, Simon McIntosh Smith had to go off. So we brought in uh, Tony Stansfield of Shawco. Okay. So uh, there's some some of these pleased anyway. <laughs> He's got his family. And autographs later for Tony. Don't disrupt the talk with the request for autographs. So uh, we, these things always rely on all audience participation. So there is uh, always a slight concern that there will be no questions, but so I can see Simon smiling, and I, I know we have one plant in the audience as well. <laughs> so sure. has anyone got a question? So I move straight to my plant. All right, Jeff. I think you had a question. Here. We all know, we all know how to, to design pro a proper programming language. We have all done it in the past. Um, but the trick is to get it established. And how how, we, how how can you actually establish a proper programming language? I think you have to be Apple. <laughs> so Intel isn't really trying to establish programming languages particularly. We are, however, very keen to establish ways that you can program parallel pro parallel machines because pretty much every die that we make has multiple cores on it. And our approach has been through things like threading building blocks and the way that we enable that is by making that a very open project. It's open source, you can download it, you can submit patches, we accept patches. Uh, we're doing similar things, our OpenMP runtime is now open source. You can download it from LLVM, it's used by the LLVM OpenMP implementation. So be as open as you can and do something attractive and continue to invest in what you're doing. So I was actually serious. It, it's, um, if you look at what Apple are managing to do with Swift, which appears to be a, a good quality sequential programming language. They've managed to get huge numbers of people on board. They're making it uh, something that you want to use to program uh, up real things on, on Apple products. Um, I think there are very few people who have the reach that, that Apple do. Uh, Google could possibly do it for, for Android, but they don't seem to have the uh, design aesthetic that Apple has. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess this is, at the moment, we, we have a situation where it seems to be one or two very large organizations, particularly Apple, which are getting involved in this. They may choose to keep on doing that, or others might join in. I mean, the other, the other, other, thing, the, the other options we've got are, are still using the web to build a big community, whether that's done as, a, as an academic or open community or something more close. Um, I mean, the academic community is capable of doing quite a lot, especially if you start teaching. Um, that's how some of our existing languages get established. Certainly, that's how C got established um, um, through, through, through the community being flooded with units. So, if there's something attractive that would hit either the academic community or the big user community, that's what establishes languages. Now, of course, in the UK, you've now got the opportunity to influence the national curriculum, and then you can cause all the, all the ten-year-olds to be taught. Uh, which would certainly have a dramatic effect. In fact, one of the most worrying things about the, uh, what's going on there is that the, if the choice turns out to be not to be a good one, we're going to end up with an entire population of people who've been taught to program with an awful language, or one that turns out to be inappropriate, and they'll find it very difficult to shake off. Uh, as I often tell people, I still tend to program in BCPL, no matter what syntax I write in. <laughs> <laughs> this is a horrible thought. Um, Carrying on from what David just said, what do you mean by a proper programming language? Because <laughs> before you can work out how to sell it, don't you need to know what it is you're selling? Uh, one that a compiler can properly analyze, one that you can, can vectorize, one that you can uh, recognize the opportunities for parallelism in, one that doesn't 
hide the algorithm, one that lets you express the algorithm in a way which you can manipulate it in some algebraic form and, and, and do clever things with it. And teach the ten-year-olds. <laughs> Probably the most receptive, aren't they? <laughs> I, think, I, mean, I think this is a good ambition. I mean, the, the thing is that uh, I suppose that's an important thing, but there are always going to be quite a lot of different programming languages. Um, and I think one of the things I was trying to get at this morning was that um, if the architecture is right, which is another issue, how do you establish good architecture, um, then it should be able to support quite a, a lot of different different language approaches. I mean, there, are, there are several approaches to parallelism, some of which are actually quite tidy. Uh, I mean, uh, one thing I've noted quite recently is that the people, some of the people who were involved in a lot of the early parallel random access machine work have, have been building realistic parallel random access machines, particularly for academic use, and they've been teaching students with it, and apparently it's really easy to program. They can get you know, first year students writing serious parallel programs, so that, that model is very powerful. People certainly run graph up with them, Simon. <laughs> How efficient is that? I'm not sure, but <laughs> it, it, the, the issue, though, Dave, is that you're saying you want to have a simple architecture, and part of what you wanted to throw away was cache coherency. And one of the reasons we have cache coherency is because a lot of the parallel programming models that people, I won't say want to, but are using, rely on it. So we have a problem that the architecture that would be clean, simple, and pleasant does not is is not substitutable for existing architectures. And, and you've just demonstrated the power of the academic community because, the, as, as was said, the reason why you like that thing is that you can hire grad students who, who know how to program it. Why on earth are all the American universities teaching their students to do that kind of programming? I mean, it's extraordinary. But I mean, you're right. I, 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 but I, um, and I don't have an immediate answer. And I, I personally wouldn't want to put that in, but I would in desperation, of course. I mean, there's a reason why the Exmos core has interest. <laughs> it has interest to make quite sure it's a host bomb standard kernel and other such stuff that relies on interest. Um, the chance people didn't have to put a slightly different world to. Yeah, uh, do we have a, a second question? No one? Right, so we'll go to Simon and we'll We'll go with you, but it's off at the moment. Thank you. I've got a really simple question that only requires an integer answer. <laughs> or, well, possibly real if you're creative. Um, what do you think is the capacity of the human mind in terms of the degree of task parallel programming capability? Obviously, data parallelism we can make as complicated as we like, you know, a vector a million elements long. <laughs> but if we're talking about independent, different tasks communicating in any way with each other, whether it's cache coherent or through messages or whatever, um, how complicated do you think people can manage? Well, I'll have a go. Oh. Um, you've got data parallelism. That's easy to handle, as you said. Um, you've got um, task farming. You can hand out tasks to individual things and collect results stuff over and over again. It's what's used for rendering movies and stuff. Um, you've got pipelines. You've got other things like that. And once you have the ability to uh, to use those um, as as components, in a normal, nested, recursive manner like we do in programming languages, you can mind anything as big as you want. Um, you, yeah, just give me the trillion processes and I'll tell you how to program them. I, I won't necessarily come up with a task that's big enough to use them all, but I suppose simulating the brain is probably quite challenging, you know. <laughs> um, um, uh, I used to have this one which was I used to throw out as an example of a use of a very large number of processes, which is realistic simulation of an entire orchestra where I want the instrument modeling so it really sounds like a violin. <laughs> no, no, they wouldn't. No, because I'd want the, 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 the nuances of the way the thing had been crafted. I'd want this. Anyway, um, no, I think, I think you can, I mean, with, with the appropriate structuring techniques, you can handle parallel, masses of parallelism, just like we have to currently handle masses of, masses of kind of sequential code. Um, um, so I don't think there's a big 
problems there. I mean, there are some issues with, certainly with if you if you're looking at um, uh, ooh, there are certainly some interesting ones where I would not imagine if a human being actually constructing a more or less ad hoc graph of a million nodes with little bit, individual bits of wiring. But something like that would you would all you might well have programs that generated those things and did it, which is what actually a lear what a learning program is often doing when it's programming neural networks. Uh, might be. Uh, that, that particular one is data parallel, but there could be some heterogeneity in the nodes. Four. Well, I mean, that's even the answer, I think, you know, the super scale of five, four, four parallels is quite easy, but not a lot more. I think, I think part of um, my answer to the question that, that was asked of Jeff about what's a suitable programming language is precisely one that can express the types of uh, parallels of communication composition um, in, in a good way, which makes things um, feasible to program large systems. As, as to the problem of taking sequential code and paralyzing it, it's a nightmare. You need a really big machine learning project to uh, attack that one. No, no, there isn't a bootstrap because because you, if you're starting from scratch, you don't represent your, your problem sequentially. The the the, 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 the problems are not not so much um, Simon's machine learning, but um, how do you uh, rebuild the world's uh, software infrastructure? Um, in parallel. That's a really hard problem. Yeah, so I, I agree with Dave. I don't think there's much of a limit if, if you're allowing me to algorithmically generate these tasks by recursion and, and in, in, you know, divide and conquer is well established in parallelism. So, well, the human conceives of the algorithm. I mean, look at the cash oblivious algorithms for doing things. You, you recursively divide the problem until it fits in the cash, which is an interesting issue in itself, but so it's self-tuning, and, it, and, and the human came up with it, but the human doesn't know how many tasks are going to be created. Now, you'll tell me it's data parallelism because all the tasks are the same. But then anything that we say that's more than four, you say, well, it's data parallel. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Roger was talking about that earlier on. He was saying it's all marketing. Yeah, I've, I've seen no evidence you can use a course on the smartphone at the same time. Well, you see, so, that, so that's David's answer. You've seen more than I've seen, yes. <laughs> so what we seem to be saying is you can have as many as you like, but there will be increasing levels of abstraction. So do you care about efficiency? How much abstraction are you willing to live with? How much nobody actually knows what the overall structure is of the program is? It's never all in one person's head. But does that matter? It can easily be all in one person said. I mean, if you, if you, if I construct a program using uh, data parallelism with with you know, a thousand or so uh, uh, nodes operating in a data parallel form, and I then use that as, or you then use a thousand of them as components of a task farm, um, I can understand that completely. Um, and I know a million processes. Now I can unwrap. What? Doesn't like data parallelism. Anything you do. Data parallelism. Oh. Um, well, it does depend what you mean by the same thing. So, threading building blocks has this thing called flow graph, which allows you to construct tasks and associate, de describe their data dependencies. And I know that we have people who have said they're using a thousand different tasks with data dependencies. Now, whether that's sensible or not, I don't know, but there are people doing that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, um, but anyway, it's probably time to move on. But a bit less abstract, but uh, <laughs> you touched on, uh, in some of the talks this morning, we touched on energy efficiency uh, almost in the same breath as performance efficiency um, in this proposed golden dawn of Internet of Things.
where presumably everything will be battery powered and energy efficiency will one of be will be one of the primary design criteria. Uh, what do the panel think will be the main developments uh, to aid energy efficiency and to keep our battery times uh, as low as possible? Will it be uh, software design? Will it be architecture? Will it be process technologies or will it be things like voltage frequency scaling, clock gating, things like that? What's the, what's the biggest gain to be had? Being turned off most of the time. Being turned off most of the time and software. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you probably need it all. Um, yeah. there's, there's no doubt that the process technology is continuing to give benefits in power saving. Um, and I, I don't think, particularly in uh, small devices, you'll see enough um, development in parallel software to mean that you can exploit uh, the, the power saving of parallel processing. Uh, but, but I think all those things will come into being because there's a, a huge challenge. In, sorry, there is a huge challenge in getting um, uh, enough uh, energy efficiency that you can either run for 20 years off the battery or harvest the, the, the power. So I'm currently working for a company whose answer to that is we're doing a memory that's half the power. Um, but that's only part of the picture. And one of the things that I've been going around saying to people is so lots of IP blocks that people are selling have a load of power downloads. Uh, but which of those actually does anybody use? Or just laughing because you can see where I'm going with this. And um, there doesn't seem to be a good answer to the which power downloads actually matter. Who knows what the power is in the system? Where is it going at any one time? What's coming next? Uh, can we turn something off? Um, it seems to be a bit ad hoc to the way that's getting in. So maybe the solution isn't we don't need to invent anything new. We just need to work out what we should be doing with what we've already got. But there seems to be quite an important issue to deal with the fact that, that well, I mean, the programmers tend to have very little clue what's going on inside the machine anyway, but they have even less clue as to what, what they're doing in the program that is going to cause the energy to get into. And we don't have much that would tell the programmer would give them any insight as to whether he should write a program one way or another. Um, that's, that's a challenge already for, um, uh, for timing, as, as, as you saw from my examples. Uh, it's, a, it's a certainly a challenge for power uh, and energy. Uh, now I don't know how you solve that. I mean, one way of solving it is to try and make the, uh, the machines a lot, an awful lot simpler and hoping, hoping that doesn't actually itself compromise efficiency. Um, uh, it ought to improve things. Um, the other way is you're going to end up wanting to be able to, to profile all this stuff so that programmers can use conventional techniques to see where their programs are using energy. I mean, one of the things that's quite interesting is the question as to what, what, what the relationship is between efficiency and energy efficiency. Because, you know, you might think that you just write a decent program the way you write a decent program, it will automatically be energy efficient. But I'm not sure that's actually true. I don't know that we even know yet. We may be able to find counter examples to that. Um, and there are certainly some interesting examples where, besides the ones I showed, where um, if you start looking up which is the most efficient way to do things um, in the textbooks, you'll get the wrong answer. Um, and there was an interesting one to do with them. Um, I think they'll tell you to a good way of counting bits in a word if it's built into the machine is to use lookup tables. But lookup tables are in memory. The memory access is expensive. So you might be better off just spinning little inst local instructions in the core. Um, so the, the, that seems to me to be quite a serious challenge. I mean, I, I, I was surprised when I noticed in that example that I gave, I did mention this, but I hadn't realized for a while that besides the effect on the cache hierarchy, there is this hidden effect inside the DRAMs, um, depending on whether you access, repeatedly access the same row or one row after another. I mean, that, that makes a huge difference to the amount of energy consumed in the DRAM. Um, the programmer would have a clue that, that that was going on. He probably wouldn't even notice, show much on the performance, but he would certainly show on the energy profile. Um, so that you were, we're really going to have to attack everything in order to get to some, to some of these well, it will be, if you can get an understanding of all of that, you are going to be able to deliver the best internet of things products. Um, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. 
actually. I'm incidentally, I'm, I'm quite confident about the UK's ability to do this kind of thing well. Uh, we have historically been quite good at building efficient, lean, mean stuff. Um, <laughs> Um, what should we look at? Yeah, to follow up on that, I know University of Bristol do a lot of research into power work and pilots, but early, and, and I think that feeds maybe into power efficiency. But early on, you did say that uh, you have not hundred options already on a pilot, which most of which people don't understand. So how does how does that you know you, you get that power efficiency? Yes, I, I, I at the risk of offending some of my colleagues, <laughs> <laughs> and we actually have quite a bit of work in this area. We, we actually have boards which we, which would be built by Simon over there, which allow us to actually monitor power consumption with fine granularity. So we can build power profiles actually for, uh, for looking at real software, and that's precisely what we're doing. Um, uh, but we've also had some experiments done to do with trying to set options on compilers, um, and it is absolutely backward, and so far we haven't managed to make any really massive improvements in performance by finding bank setting. And, and, and not, nor have we found, I think, much divergence between we found a little bit, but not much diverted between what you do for just performance as opposed to energy efficiency. Um, um, the um, the thing that uh, sort of worries me a bit that I mentioned there is, is when by the time we got to the point where we're trying to use machine learning algorithms to analyze the programs to figure out which way to set the flags, I, I think we've sort of lost the plot here. Simon might approve of this thing this time. <laughs> Um, and and I, I mean, it, sort of, it also sort of slightly worries me as a computer scientist, because it, it sounds a bit like sort of solving the halting problem or something, you know. I mean, the, 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 you can, it's obvious I could write a program that basically says, if some funny condition then behave like this, else behave like something completely different. And then I'll bury the thing that changes the condition somewhere deep in another part of the source, and there's no piece of machine learning, um, at least not in my lifetime or Simon's, I think, <laughs> to actually unravel. <laughs> But, but of course, it, it does. They, they do work up to a point for sort of fairly well-behaved programs. You can, with a certain amount of automatic <laughs> flag setting, if it's, you know, if, if all that happens is variation in, in registers. But going back to Tony's point about using what we've already got, it's harder than it sounds. I think. But, but I mean, look, look, look at the challenge for the, you know, if, if we ask somebody to go and write a compiler uh, and put the appropriate flag in for optimizing for energy, what the hell will he do? <laughs> okay. okay, I've got another question that one of the, uh, of the internet, so one of our listeners. So um, I think we, we, we all recognize today that there are a lot of opportunities going forward. I guess internet things is, a, is an obvious one, but, um, and Simon's, uh, and robotics, and intelligent systems with Simon into that, and Simon hinted that possibly a third type of processor required for that. But uh, in terms of existing cores, do you think we've got what we need to exploit these, these opportunities in robotics, internet of things, uh, autonomous cars, that type of thing? Well, I think we're missing um, simple to use, simple to program um, solutions, simple to join together solutions. Um, the complexity of the high performance cores um, the job of getting them off the board, getting them up and running, getting a program in them um, is, I still think, far harder than it, it needs to be. It's very easy for people who are used to using them to think it's okay. But actually, it's uh, obvious, to me, it's obvious it's a barrier. And um, I, I've seen people describing um, trying to use some of these complex FPGAs with embedded processors. And you realize the amount of knowledge you need to, to have right. in order to just be able to bootstrap the thing, get a system up and running. It, it, it's an order of magnitude more difficult than it needs to be. And a lot of it comes from unnecessary complexity. Complexity that was put in to address producing very fast sequential processes, which are probably not the right thing for a lot of electronic systems rather than computer systems. So I think the issue of addressing what type of components we need for electronic systems wants to be revisited. I'll second that. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I said this partly this morning. I think that uh, we actually have, and I, I noticed this, by the way, in trying to teach with this, with these kind of things, we actually have really little, very, very 
not much technology at all that's actually really easy to use. You just want to put it in the hands of a student and say, hey, get on with it. Um, uh, and actually, the, this whole business of sort of packaging the technology up in a way that actually make, makes it easy for people to, to use and get their heads around and, and, and work with is, I think, terribly important. I think it's a very important thing to things. Because I think most of the right ideas are going to come from, from if, if we enable them to and put, it, put the technology in their hands, will come from, from startups and people with bright ideas. Um, uh, I mean, I've seen one example of this that, that happened here in Bristol where um, we have this, this product which is now selling pretty well called the Alpha Sphere, an entirely novel musical instrument. It looks like a sphere. That came into existence by a student who basically had the sort of cool idea of a mock which I thought was just paper cups and, and elastic bands more or less. Um, and, uh, uh, and I happened to be looking at what he was doing. He was struggling trying to figure out how to put the electronics around it and stuff. And I gave him two or three X mock boards. said, oh, that's fairly easy to use, especially to do my performance review with it. And he knocked up the prototypes of this thing fairly quickly and, and, and got, you know, got the company going. I don't think they still use it, but they didn't need all of the things. They probably use the simple device now. But actually, it allowed them to very quickly do that. So what we were doing there was putting a, an easy-to-use use piece of technology, easy to throw them in the hands of somebody who was a full designer, basically. Um, and, and I think that's what you need to do. Uh, you know, and, and, and they just didn't, they just aren't things like this. Used, a long time ago, I was shown a wonderful thing called the basic scan. You know, I don't know if you remember this thing. I mean, you programmed it in basic. It was a basically simple microcontroller. It's a sort of tip for you, actually. It was instrumental in establishing that microchip's its business system. But it went all over the place. It, was, it wasn't very high performance. The basic was interpreted. But it was easy to, to, to flick, flick on and off and control things. And stuff. So anybody could do this thing, obviously. Um, and that was picked up and turned quite right. So, um, it, it is a real sense of opportunity. So, so if you actually have a have an easy to use piece of technology, preferably one that can be connected together, <laughs> so, so so people can play with understanding concurrency. I think this would make a big difference in some of these areas. Um, and I also think you'd get easily enough performance in there to increase a lot of the time. So where might we find that technology in there? Where might we find that technology in there? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should have a pitch start the project. <laughs> So you, it seems like the message is to uncomplicate our uh, over complex processes. Well, there are things like Arduino, which people have probably heard about, which are trying trying to address some of those things. Um, and Intel has some boards that take Arduino shielding or Arduino compatible. So whether our processes are simple. Is it? The, the x86 that I mentioned in my talk is quite simple. No, it's a simpler one than that. It's the one that was put together for the uh, sub-threshold. Uh. Uh, one thing that I've noticed over the years is, uh, rest back to what we were talking about before, there's a lack of communication between hardware and software people. Um, and often it reflects company organization, but there's a hardware team and there's a software team, and there isn't really any mechanism for them to talk to each other. Um, and then, so if we're saying, how do we optimize for power? Um, whose responsibility is that? You know, that? I think there are some things which aren't necessarily a technological problem. They're a, they're a human problem. And maybe we should fix some of our problems before we start on the machine's problem. But it's not just hardware and software people. I mean, the classic story from the 60s was you could tell how many people were on the compiler team by how many passes the compiler made. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's if, that's there's a there's a human communication side of the problem as well as a machine communication side of the problem, um, and yeah, maybe that's maybe that's where some of the innovation is going to come from. It's actually us working out what we're trying to do, um, and then getting into the chip. Just to wrap up the final question, for the, unless there's one more from the audience, and it's in the end to go up. So there's no more on the internet. I think we're just going to wrap up and just uh, ask the panel probably a tough question. If you were sat here in five five years' time, what do you think the uh, the main issues you'll be discussing in five years' time will be? Tough one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll still be talking about the end of Moore's Law, and Intel will still be trying to push it, because that's what we think we do. Um, 
energy will still be critical. We probably won't have got to an exaflop, so we'll still be whiffling about that. So no other than that. I hope we won't be talking about the need for somebody to invent a, a, a new parallel programming language to, to move us forward. Um, and I hope... Uh, <laughs> and um, I think the other thing will be moaning the fact that these people are churning out uh, phones with lots of cores and nobody understands why you need more than two. I, I thought we agreed for. Roger says two. <laughs> He's got a presentation about it, you can ask him later. <laughs> Software will still be very high on the agenda. <laughs> that isn't going to go away. Um, and um, other stuff will progress more slowly than any of us would actually want, want it to. Uh, I do. Software will still be the major, our major issue. As is what no, I said. think software will. Well, so software is going to, as I said this morning, you know, it's not obvious what other show there is in town. But we're getting more of anything, actually. Right. So. So you know, it's either it's either you know clear from the point of view that we're trying to use more parallelism somehow, which is going to come down to languages or or, or something, um, uh, or, um, uh, or or it's to do with the fact that we're trying to increase energy efficiency to get into some of these newer opportunities. In which case, same story. Because software is going to be one of the primary ways to doing it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think this is going to be something that's going to happen overnight because. Um, it, it's relatively slow to change, but it might well be that, that you know, once, once people realise that this is the only way they can they can achieve what they want to, then it may just focus a bit more attention on it. Because um, at the moment, it seems to me to be under undervalued but for some reason. Um, we, we focused a huge amount of effort and investment on on sustaining Moore's law. Actually, I mean, yeah. if, if a tiny fraction of that money had been spent on on, on looking, looking at software and algorithms and stuff one would have thought we'd have made a lot more progress. And by the way, the internet of things will happen more slowly than most people think. Um, there, are, there are big challenges to actually delivering that enormous range of potentials. Um, um, and uh, if you want to see what I mean, I think somewhere on my website there's a, uh, a talk which is dated 2001 that somebody drew to my attention, I've forgotten it was there, it's called Why Wear a Computer? Uh, and it sketches out many different things that one might be doing in wearing a computer, uh, of which I think only about half of so far have been. Um, and, and, and the reason why a lot of the others haven't happened is because various things, you know, have got in the way. Half's probably quite a good hit rate, would have thought. Sorry? Half's, Half's quite is a not good. a bad hit rate. Yeah, but it, you know, it's uh, uh, the ones that have rolled out, rolled out fairly quickly were things like um, sport, sports monitoring and stuff. And so on, which of course is eventually going to become a really big one as it turns into health monitoring and stuff as well. But it's only just just happening you know, 10, 10, 12 years on from when it was obviously going to be possible. Um, well, another one that, that still hasn't quite happened was that we thought was going to happen fairly quickly was uh, sort of gaming in the streets, walking walkout games. Um, and the reason that has not happened is because you can't make it happen until everybody's got a fairly powerful platform on them. Now that they all have mobile phones with that solar on and bits and pieces in, even my students are beginning to write walk-in, walk-out games. So it's, uh, it's, that's, that is going to happen, but a lot, a lot later than I expected. Um, and some of the others just, just haven't been. Um, um, uh, where will we, we be in five years' time? Um, I spent a large part of my last 15 years working on reconfigurable logic. Uh, there's one of the FPGA conferences which every five years or so has a session on where will we be in five years time and they also show what they thought five years ago and it's basically it's always the same things that come top of the list. We'll still be complaining that the tools aren't quite what we'd like the tools to be. We'll still be complaining that we haven't quite cracked how to partition things across the fabric that we've got. We'll still be, you know, there will always be the same problems. Um, and that's partly because those problems are hard. Um, and it's partly because the applications keep getting more complicated. So 
you know, you improve the tools, but then somebody thinks, I have the tools are better, now I'll try a more complex problem. So you always end up, you know, there is, it is, there is no easy answer. We've got all the easy answers. Um, there are still hard problems, and they're still hard. Um, we might be a bit closer, but I think we'll still be complaining about the same things. There is, um, there is one answer from the internet as well, rather than a question, and the answer in five years' time will still be bemoaning the death of the transmuter. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but we shan't, because we're going to reinvent this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you heard it here, we're going to reinvent the transmuter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings us to the end of the, the, the uh, don't rush off yet, we just want to say thank, thank you to our sponsors as well, but first of all, thank you to our panel, Roger, Jim, Kevin, thank you. And we're just going to say a final thank you, I think we're going to say a final thank you, yeah. So thank you for attending. Hope you've enjoyed it today. As I say, we've got more, each year this event grows, and hopefully we'll grow next year. We've had some feedback already. I think we're going to try and get some more software engineers in the room next year, definitely. So, um, and possibly even you know, apps developers as well. But right up to the top of boo. Someone said boo. <laughs> How do I people say? Um, and yeah. So, um, but first of all, thank you to our sponsors, Bristol and Bath, uh, who are trying to promote this cluster. We, we do think we have a, a significant cluster. It's recognised internationally. Our cluster has been significant for high tech and also the overlap with creative. So um, thank you to Bristol and Bath. Uh, Dulos, who had the stand as well, Imagination, the their stand, Motorbeck, QNX, and INET, who put some money into the event as well. Um, all our speakers and demonstrators from today, hopefully you found it useful. Do fill in the feedback forms because we want to know how to improve for next year. We are going to have a sick from Optical. Don't worry, um, but we, the feedback forms to help us to make the sixth one better than the fifth one. Thank you.